Welcome everybody to Take 5 with the Prez. This is our new attempt to have you in, meet some of the most interesting people here at Blackburn College and I get the chance to ask them five questions and they have the chance to ask me five questions. We're going to cover everything from the serious to the philosophical to the quirky and strange. So buckle in everybody. Our first guest, our guinea pig in yeah, the situation, the scientific, the scientific method, this is what we're doing Ed, is Ed Zalisco, yeah. professor of biology here at Blackburn yeah. College. We're very pl pleased that agreed to be here. We appreciate Absolutely. you Absolutely. Guinea pig is what we do. And Ed, yeah. I, I, my first question to you yeah. is you've got to describe what you brought here on the table and, and well, what's going on. Well, I wanted to make sure that we did something to honor this very special day because exactly 209 years ago, two unbelievably famous people, here we are in Illinois, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin were born on the same day at the same year 209 years ago. So I have my Darwin Day mug. I have a needlepoint designed and stitched by the other Dr. Zalesko, my son, who's just received his PhD in chemistry. And we have a birthday cupcakes for the president. And, and if you'd like to come forward, you could have some too, but I don't think that's uh, possible. Warn me when you're going to have a long answer. I can start on a cupcake at the right time. <laughs> that's all right. So Ed, how, how long have you been teaching here at Blackburn? Yeah, so I've been here uh, 29 years at Blackburn. I did two years of teaching at Southeast Missouri State University. Now, that job turned into permanent, but I also had the offer to come here. And so I chose Blackburn 29 years ago um, because of the dedication to uh, really undergraduate education, but also the work program, which just plain old makes us so special and a wonderful place. It's a long answer. Well, Blackburn <laughs> College and our students are very lucky you made that choice well, 29 you. years ago. Thank you. All right, I'm ready here. now. It's, I think it's your turn. Oh, I get to uh -oh, start out. Uh -oh. So we, we're trading questions, uh, and, and I get to go first. And it's a big one, because in those 29 years, so it's a nice lead off of your question, in those 29 years, how has my teaching changed? It's tra changed tremendously, and the answer is with technology. So my question is, how do you think higher ed across the country is going to change in the next 30 years? I really think the future in higher ed is really going to be about access and affordability. Too many schools are going down this road right now of wanting rankings and prestige, and so that means they're throwing all their money and all their time at 30 ACTs and 4.0 GPAs, and those are great students. We get them here at Blackburn, too. But the reality is we're freezing so many students out of the system, yeah. and that's a real attack on our democracy, and so we have to get that right, and the schools that don't get that right won't survive, because there yeah. aren't enough of those, only the elite students for most of these schools yeah. to survive, so we've got to get right about that. Yeah. My favorite thing about Blackburn is we're already right on that. Well, I feel yeah. that way, yeah. and I'm really glad, and we're certainly doing better. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, and that motivates donors and students and everyone. Absolutely. So another thing that motivates folks around here is our biology program, if I may say, is second to none. Well, we're happy about it. Well, I, and you should be happy about it. Our, uh, the students love it. We have great placement rates in a middle school and everything else. What do you think makes it so different here? Yeah, um, it's, it's one of the uh, real joys is to get to recruit at Blackburn because you get to try to polish this kind of an answer. Uh, in short, the work program sets us completely apart from everybody else. So right now, for me, I have four students working 10 hours a week to help me out. In fact, they were just here in the zoology lab. Uh, 20 hours a week our students have for individual tutoring time. And I say to the students, I don't know anywhere else in the country where any kind of time like that is provided with tutors uh, individually for a class. And the reason is, is they'd have to pay them. And so they'd have to come up with a budget. Mm -hmm. And because of the work program where we're all helping to make the system work and help in different ways, that students who come to Blackburn um, get to have someone who's a year or two ahead of them who have excelled and can say, look, I was just in your seat two years ago, a year ago, and here's the way things are. Uh, here's what worked for me, and let's see what can work for you. Uh, in addition, and I really love it, and our students come back from job interviews and, and, or professional school interviews and tell us, when, when they come, go to the interview, someone will say, well, tell me about this work program. What did you do? And one thing they get to say is, look, my job in medicine is going to be uh, talking to patients and explaining things. I've been doing that for the last four years. I've been explaining biology to people of all different backgrounds. Students are majors. Students are non-majors. And so I've been thinking about how do I try to make meaningful connections to people. Um, that's the two of the biggies, helping out in the class. But the third part really matters, and that is, in society, uh, we, I think, will prosper as a society in the United States if we appreciate the roles that each other plays. And when you're in a small community like Blackburn, 
you quickly know who it is that likely fixed the light bulbs or cooked your meal or uh, mowed the grass outside. And because you see that connectedness, I think our, our graduates will go on to better understand and appreciate other people's roles. It's a long answer, but... It's, it's, it's a long it's answer, a good but answer. It's, a great, it's a great answer. The, the work program has all these side benefits that I think until you're here, you don't exactly. really understand what's going on. Exactly. That's a great example. Yeah. So this is another big one, one uh, and so I'll give you the setup for where I'm coming from. We've revised the Gen Ed program twice since I've been here, and in each case people ask a very good question, which is what are we trying to do here? And in each case my answer has been we're trying to create educated citizens. Um, we're trying to create, and so take that apart, we're trying to create citizens, whatever that means, to be responsible and to be well informed. So my question to you is what do you think are the obligations of every citizen in the United States. What are we preparing? Wow. What is it citizens should be able to do in the United States? Okay, so all of my old political science professors are now on pins and needles watching <laughs> to see how I do in yeah. this answer, yeah. so no pressure. Yeah. I appreciate that. The old political science majors gotta yeah. come out here. I really think we're obligated to have an informed citizenry. That's the basis of democracy, yeah. right? We have opened this up so that everyone is engaged in theory and ought to be participating, not just in voting, but in the conversation and the accountability process of government. And the reality is, a lot of that has to do with how educated you are to be able to be a part of that conversation. And that's the reason why I'm scared. So many colleges are getting so professionalized, right? You are trained for this very narrow thing. And, and you're not broadly ed educated, liberally educated, you're trained for this narrow thing. And that's bad for the student because in 20 years, someone will invent a robot to do that exactly. little thing. And then what do you do? Yep. And it's bad for society because you're not informed on economics or politics or biology or whatever it is that's going to be in the news that you ought to have some ability to judge, to think critically about, yep. besides just taking whatever the talking head on TV tells you. Yep. And so that's what we do here and at other liberal arts colleges too that I think is often missing in higher education other places. Yep. Very much a nice background. Uh, well, I don't know. I will see. Uh, we'll, have to ask, we'll have to ask uh, how, my, how my grade was and all that stuff. So, Ed, you are very well known for your teaching. I mean, you've won teaching awards. I've been in your class. You're an inspirational, engaging. You sort of get excited in the process, and the students love it. Do you have a teacher that inspired you when you were in school? Hmm. Um, well, I want to say something really positive, but I, I have to be honest. Uh, I'm actually inspired by what people didn't do for me uh, and came in largely, I've told people before, with my arms crossed and of the attitude that, boy, I wish someone had had a lecture outline for me or textbook objectives for me or very clear expectations of what I needed to know. And so, honestly, I have one teacher that had uh, objectives in 11 years of college and I got a teaching certificate along with a bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Um, I had one person that did these objectives, no gave, none ever gave me an outline. Yeah. And I have outlines for all my classes. I did, Dr. Martin, I would be, uh, so when the inspirational teacher that I had, I was a person who pretty much through World War II, it was in his 40s before he got a PhD, I came over from Czechoslovakia and really took me under his wing. And he had really weird analogies. So if, if he wanted to explain how can you section a cell and miss the nucleus, he would bring in, really did, a hard-boiled egg uh, that was going to be his lunch. And he would section the egg and say, can I, hit, can I section this egg and miss the yolk? And he would do that. But then it got better, because then he'd eat the egg in the luncher and spew egg as he's explaining about how he sectioned the cell. So Dr. Martin inspired me with a number of, uh, a number of analogies. Uh, another thing I used uh, just yesterday, we were looking for something in the lab and I said, guys, you can't make this up. You, you actually have to see what's there. You just can't, it's not like looking at clouds and trying to see characters. And my, Dr. Martin, I called him over one day in the microscope and I was trying to figure something out. And he, he had a pipe, so these were the old days. And he's puffing on the pipe and looking through the microscope and he said, uh, young man, if you look long enough, you'll see the face of Lincoln. <laughs> and the point, of course, is, it, is it don't make stuff up. You either see what you see or it's not there. Um, so I was inspired by Dr. Martin. And he's no longer with us, um, but, but he really gave me the inspiration for a lot of analogies and fun stories and crazy things. So I get, I'm going to blame him for being crazy. That's yeah, great. Well, and our alums tell stories about their professors from 50 years ago. Oh, 50 years from now, they'll be telling Ed's a little oh, story. Oh, I don't doubt that. 
about that at all. And they probably will. They are online right now on Facebook. <laughs> that, that's certainly the case. Well, now I have my most serious question for oh, you. Oh, my gosh. Um, and so it's a have you or would you question, okay. and it's about bungee jumping. Have you ever uh, bungee jumped? I have not. And would you? I would, absolutely. I've been skydiving. Uh, you have? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. In fact, for my 21st birthday, I was in grad school, and I thought, what's, you know, everyone goes drinking for the 21st birthday. That is not exciting. I mean, I'm going to do something different here. And so I gathered up all my buddies, and uh, 20 of us went skydiving oh together. And we were all running the residence halls at the University of Central Missouri, yeah. Central Missouri State at the time. And so we told the director of housing, if a plane goes down, you're yeah. on your own. Because yeah. we're all going on the airplane right now, and we oh, wouldn't jump fun. out of an airplane together. And it went well? I'm still here. Yeah. Did the chute open automatically? Or, or? It was a static line jump. So I was connected yeah. to the airplane and sort of like the Army Rangers yeah, or whatever yeah. you jump out and it pulls. Okay. But we had to do four hours of training because if you got tangled or whatever, yeah, you got yeah. there alone. And they had a lawyer at the beginning of the training <laughs> on a videotape explaining to you that you could die. Yeah. And, you know, this this is, you know, this this could go badly for you yeah. and so forth and so on. And, yeah. you know, you have to know that going in and sign this waiver or whatever, whatever. And then in the middle of the, at the end of his talk on the video, he turned around and he jumped out of an airplane. I thought that was very effective. Oh, that was really cool. Best, best lawyer thing I've ever seen. Oh, uh, how about that? So, yeah. Well, good, good for you. I'm not quite sure. I'm brave enough to do that. You so. wouldn't do that? I don't know yet. I don't know. Oh, no one It hasn't ever... come up. Knowing your summer adventures, you like to try new things. I, I know, think, absolutely. Uh, I haven't jumped out of plane yet. All right, so I got lucky that when I when I arrived here five years ago, this beautiful building, yeah. the Hand Science Wing, was already here. Yeah. And I think it, I've been told, really transformed the science programs and absolutely. really lit things on fire around here. You were a part of the design process yes. here. What makes this building so special and effective? Yeah, well, so a number of things. Um, and, and it's, uh, I, I, I want to be positive, but you almost start with the negative. What didn't we have that we have now? Um, so what we had before were hallways, labs, and offices. And what we didn't have was this, the very space that we're in right now, which was a common community space. And something that's very special at Blackburn uh, is that Students, students sitting around studying, and while we're, if we have time, professor will just sit down and chit chat. And it's really interesting about the atrium space here, in that um, it's a very relaxed. You're not in my office. I'm not in your office. It's it's a community space, and so there's not a lot of tension. If if a student comes in my office, they're worried I'm going to give them good news or bad news, and not sure what's going to, you know, who knows what it's going to be. So you're a little tense, and you're also attentive to do I need to get on with something else. And so it's a really nice, neutral place where you can visit. I tell people when the labs or lectures, if you need to make a phone call, if you need to go out and eat lunch or whatever, this is the place to socialize. And I think that, um, honestly, some students that are pretty quiet otherwise will, will be out here and can mingle and make friends. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's a connection for an awful lot of students. Um, a, a few other things, and I'm looking around at some of the office space. We have all the science offices together. That wasn't the case before. I love that I can stick my head out of my office and yell to see, yeah. see if Dr. Armstrong is in to ask about chemistry. Uh, we wanted it in behind glass, but it's not completely enclosed. There's gaps there in the glass to let the air flow out. Um, and so we have a, a sort of incremental quieter spots. This is the louder spot. It's quieter in that area. Of the, some students call the bubble. And then in the faculty offices, even quieter. I love the environmental uh, values that we send with an unfinished floor. We argued for that. Uh, people may not know when they're in here and looking around and looking, they don't see behind me, but the panels that, are, that look like sort of cheap particle board are actually wheat stems. Uh, they're the leftover after harvesting wheat, um, and I wish we had a little plaque for that. Uh, so much of what I like about the recycled air in the very first year we had, and if you want to go long answer, the short answer, but in this room, uh, in the very first year, I came out and saw a student sitting at a table, and I didn't recognize him in biology, and I said, so are you a biology major? And he said, no. Uh, and I said, oh, good. Uh, you just like the space? And he said, yeah, I have asthma, and it's the best air on campus. Oh, really? And I thought, well, that wasn't what we had before. <laughs> before, you would smell because you came from the biology building. Um, and it, it's a very nice sociable space. It's brought the faculty together, it brings the students together. Um, I think there's an absolute sense of community here, and I, I absolutely love it. The person, uh, Ed Smith, who was really the, the master brains behind designing all of this and building this, um, Ed and I had sat down and consulted on some of the things we wanted, and uh, just, I was so delighted about five years after it opened, because I think this is our, 10th year. We're in our 10th mm -hmm. year of this yeah. building being open. About five years afterwards, Ed showed up in my office 
And I was just so delighted because I said, Ed, it really has worked out the way we wanted. Um, what we had anticipated about the congregation of students and the social network and the efficiency of communication has really worked out well. And it was a very nice moment because sometimes you want to tell people thank you and they're not around. And yeah. I was able to see yeah. Ed and tell him thank you. So that was gratifying yeah. for him. Yeah. Yeah. He has a good name, too. It is a yeah, good name. Absolutely. Well, now I didn't need to turn serious, because I have a question of something. It's an issue you and I talked about. Mm -hmm. It's very much in the media, and so maybe some of our members of the audience will be interested, um, because other major universities are facing this question. So you've got to listen to the longer setup. If a Blackburn group invites someone to come to speak on campus, and that speaker is expected to express opinions that are quite contrary to our campus values, what should be the reaction of the college, Mr. President? Well, no pressure on that one, right? <laughs> no I mean, you better knock on wood when you ask questions like that, because now it's going to happen, right? We've been lucky well, this hasn't happened too often here. Yes, not yeah. too often. And so I, I, the reality is I tell people that it, at colleges, we're equal opportunity offenders. Stick around long enough, and you will hear something that offends you. And in fact, that mix of ideas is a good thing. And just because you speak on campus doesn't mean that we endorse what you're saying, right. but we think it's important to expose students to other reasonable ideas. Now, that's where it gets a little tricky, is how do you judge that? Would right. we allow a Ku Klux Klan rally on campus? I don't think that we would. And right. we're a private college, so we don't have to. But if it's a conservative or very liberal political ideology, well, you don't have to agree with it. We ought to be able to have an environment where we allow that conversation to have. Right. And what I tell folks is, if you don't like what's being said, then you have a freedom of speech as well. Not to interrupt the person, but to have your own event, to have your own protest. And I would encourage that activity if we got something controversial on campus. And I endorse that, just want yeah. you to know. I, uh, it, we have to understand that in the United States, the right to free speech doesn't mean the right to silence others right. so that you can talk. Right. It means to give everybody the chance. And we've seen that behavior from both sides of the, of the political have. spectrum, trying yeah. to shut the other side up. And that yeah. is not the point of what we do around here. Yeah. Not it's at back all. To, that citizen and obligation is to, to listen sometimes and to hear the opposing point of view. Thank you. So Ed, I, I have a, for a zoologist, I have a yeah. very high pressure question. Uh -huh. What's your spirit animal? Oh, my spirit animal. I thought you were going to ask my favorite. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, so uh, one of my favorite mammals is a rhino. Because okay. he's nearsighted, he's not really angry at anybody, he just wants to be left alone to his grass, you know? And, and he always looks a bit like he has been bugged all day long. Now, manatees are the same deal in the sea, but they're just always happy. So I don't know what it is in the, in the kelp or whatever they're eating that makes them happy. But a rhino just always looks like it's just one too many birds or something that's big and bugging them. So I think it's probably on a busy day, I'm a rhino. I'd rather think that I'm the spirit of a manatee in which I'm always pleasant. How about that? Yeah. Well, rhino, should students worry about getting run over by, yeah, by the force that is Ed's You know, it, the, rhinos right. are, are, the rhinos are just scary. They look scary. But the truth is, is that <laughs> you're probably going to be OK. Right. Yeah, if you get far enough, <laughs> poor little rhinos. Yeah, what did they ever do? Yeah, and my last question for you has to do right. with the cupcakes. Yes. So my wife, uh, Amy Zalisco, was able to cook us up some cupcakes. What's your best thing you can make in the kitchen? I am great at breakfast. I can make omelets that are oh. uh, beautiful, I mean, just hold together perfectly. I can make pancakes and French toast and waffles and the crispiest, most delicious bacon you ever had. I'm an artist at breakfast. Beyond breakfast, I've got nothing. Yeah, nothing. And so when I'm home alone yeah. with the kids, we say, oh, what should we make for dinner? And they're like, let's have breakfast for dinner. Oh, there you go. I'm great. That's let's have breakfast for dinner. Everybody loves it. So you have these skills. Do yes. you do it then? Or like Sunday morning, are you making breakfast? Every weekend. Right. Right? At least one of the weekend days. Sunday, we're rushed by church usually. Yeah. But Saturday yeah. morning, yeah. typically pancakes or waffles or something Good like that's you. going on in the Comerford house. Good not to you. worry, not to worry. And I have one last question for you, Ed, and it's the classic. If you could have a conversation with one person, living or dead, who would yeah. it be? Yeah. I've had a, a, a positive uh, hope or dream someday if I get a time machine. I want to go back to the founding fathers and tell them it worked. That's it. I want to go back in this great democracy of ours and, and say, uh, guys, whatever you had in mind, Holy cow, 200, 230 years ago, or more than 230 years ago, if you use 1776. Um, 
it's just that. I get chills. I just keep imagining. It's the one conversation I like to play out in my head. Is that I, I get to sneak in, try to explain. To Benjamin Franklin is the one I would want to visit with, I guess. Um, and somehow explain to Mr. Franklin that from the future, and I didn't expect that he wouldn't believe me. And then say, but, but here's the crazy thing I want you to know, is that it worked. And that's it. If you don't, I'm not going to tell you about all the inventions and stuff and screw up all that stuff about the time continuum. But I want you to know it worked. Um, and it's about saying thank you, and that's what it, it really is for me. Anyway, well, and meaning well, meaning and, while, and meanwhile, thank you for this thank conversation. You, Ed, thank you, and it works because of professors like you inspiring students to participate in our democracy. So well, thank you for what thank you do. You. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Ed Zalisco again for being our great first guest. You never know who you're going to find on Take 5 with the Prez. We'll see you next time. <laughs>